In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful. Hello, my dear viewers of Mount Hussein TV. I'm your host, Ali Jassim, and it is a pleasure to be with you on Current Events. My colleagues and I have decided to dedicate this episode and the next series of episodes of the program, The Expansion of Islam, to spread the teachings of the religion of Islam and to discuss its different dimensions. So stay with us. According to the last researches conducted by the Pew Research Center, the religion of Islam not only has the highest growth rate among other religions, but also, according to the estimations, this religion will be the only religion which will have a higher growth rate than the growth rate of the people of the world in the next 35 years. It has been estimated that the world's population will have a growth rate of about 35% within the years 2010 to 2050, while the growth rate of the religion of Islam among people is estimated to be around 73% in total. However, it also has been estimated that within this period of time, the growth rate of the religion of Christianity will increase by 35%, the Hindus by 34%, the Jews by 16 and the other religions with lower rates respectively. The results of the researches conducted by the Research Center predict that in the year 2050, the Muslims will form about 30% of the world's population, while the Christians will form about 31% of the world's population. This study also reveals that in the year 2100, the religion of Islam, which will be forming 35% of the world's population, will become the most followed religion in the world. One of the key factors in the growth of the Muslims' population in the world is that the fact that they have a higher rate of birth in comparison to other religions, which is partly due to the geographical position and the dominant culture in these areas. Of course, there is another significant reason, and it is the logic and ideology of Islam. Ever since the tragic events of 9-11 that took place in 2001 in the United States, and until this very moment, there have been many changes in the world. Many wars were waged, many governments were overthrown, and many terrorist groups were formed, one of which is Daesh, or ISIS terrorist group, whose members are committing unspeakable crimes in the name of Islam against the humanity all over the world. There are a number of open-minded people who seek to find out the truth about Islam. When such people learn about the true teachings of Islam, they will witness there is a huge difference between the true teachings of Islam and the deviant ideology of the extremists and thus embrace this religion and become Muslims. In this portion of time, the media channels are always blaming the religion of Islam for the acts of terrorism. Nevertheless, you can always find some open-minded people conducting in-depth researches to find out the truth, and when they do, they would change their course in life forever. However, there are several points we should examine in this series of episodes. The first point which we will discuss in this program is how will the spread of terrorist groups like ISIS affect Islam's expansion? Will that cause people to research more about this religion so the increased rate of Islam will grow? Or will it make people disregard Islam because of the current savagery of ISIS that is not accepted by any human being in the world? In today's part of the program, we will talk about the growth of the religion of Islam in the world with our dear guest, Sheikh Muhammad al hilli Sheikh al hilli is a renowned Islamic preacher and teacher of Islamic studies at a number of universities in the West. Stay tuned, my dear viewers. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum, dear viewers. Welcome to the first episode of the Expansion of Islam series. Um, in this episode, we will discuss the expansion of Islam in general with our dear guest, Sheikh Muhammad al hilli the prominent international Islamic preacher and an Islamic studies teacher at a number of universities in the West. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikhna. Alaikum assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. As you know, the birth rate in the Muslim residing countries is much higher than the Christian residing countries. It is estimated that the population of the Muslims will significantly increase in the next years. And they would form the greatest population in the world. What would you like to say about that? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful. With regards to the Muslim numbers around the world, it is certainly uh, a fact that many international organizations 
research companies such as Pew International Research as well as others have demonstrated the, uh, the expansion in terms of numbers. Not only do we find this in Muslim countries but also in non-Muslim countries specifically in the West such as in Europe as well as in uh, North and South in America. For example you find that estimates have come forward to suggest that perhaps by 2050 the population of Muslims in the West specifically or if we were to talk about the uh, Europe as an example uh, will go by at least three or four times more than what it is today and that is not only due to the um, increasing birth rate but also due to the migration that we see uh, happening from the Middle East, for example, and the establishment of the Muslims in different parts of Europe and in the Americas that are welcoming other Muslims as well to, uh, to be pre present in those countries. Um, but there is no doubt that um, the birth rate in Muslim land is certainly um, uh, adding to the increasing numbers. But what is really interesting is the fact that if you look at uh, countries in Middle East and in Africa, you find there is a uh, increasing violence and disease as well as factors which limit the growth uh, of numbers, yet we're still seeing the expansion and uh, the birth rate going up and the number of Muslims increasing. And that is due to a number of reasons. Perhaps one of them is the recommendations in Islamic teachings about having more children and to be able to bring them up in the right manner as well. Uh, the second is because of perhaps the more cultural emphasis upon the females to be present in the house to be looking after the children. So the idea then is that the husband would seek the livelihood and the wife would be a compassionate, loving mother um, uh, who would bring up the children. Therefore, it encourages more and more um, births, so to speak. These yeah. factors and all more seem to have contributed to the uh, increasing numbers of Muslims in, in different parts of the world. Thank you so much for that, Sheikh Nam. The next question, in your opinion, what part does the higher birth rate of Muslims play in turning the population of Muslims into the greatest population in the world? I think at the moment, if we look at the um, statistics that talk about the number of Muslims in the world, um, the recent, some of the recent statistics, such as by the Pew Research, uh, suggest they are 1.6 billion in the world it's definitely more likely to be higher than that mm -hmm. and it is the second largest uh, following of a religion in the world after Christianity more people and are converting they yes a yes people, and right. it, uh, of course in addition to the people who are uh, reverting and, and, and uh, accepting the path of Islam but certainly the growing birth rate is making a, 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 a positive increase in the numbers. This is because if we look at some countries, non-Muslim countries, um, personally living in the West, I have seen this um, practically, that you find, for example, in some Christian predominant uh, families or um, Hindu and other religions you have, for example, there isn't as much of an emphasis on uh, increasing numbers mm -hmm. and more birth um, perhaps there is uh, a, a cultural kind of restriction in their mind um, whereas it seems that the Muslim family is more inclined to be larger in number um, and we see this on a, on a practical level in the United Kingdom and in other parts where if you were to compare an average size of a Muslim family to that of a non-Muslim family, you'll find the Muslim family is considerably bigger. Uh, you would have, for example, more of the children, more of the mm -hmm. uh, offsprings, and so on. Whereas a non-Muslim family perhaps would be satisfied with one or two. One or two exactly. And you see in one of the world's largest countries, and that's China, there is a restriction mm -hmm. on the birth um, 
of, of the children. For many years, they were only re allowed to have one child. Now there's two. Although recently they have changed. Yeah, two, no, yeah. But the reason why they've changed is because they've realized there's a huge problem in terms of future development, future uh, reproduction, because uh, there will be an imbalance between males and females. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember that uh, prophetic narrations, narrations from the glorious family of the Holy Prophet, the Ahlul Bayt, peace and blessings be upon them, encourage uh, child uh, birth and to have more numbers. As an example, uh, the Prophet Muhammad uh, sallallahu alayhi wa wasallam in a narration uh, which is often recited in wedding ceremonies, in nikah, uh, to encourage the husband and the wife to think about, you know, children. Uh, uh, the Prophet of Islam is narrated to have said, get married, bring children so that your numbers increase. And then he says, That I will say on the day of judgment that uh, look at the number of Muslims that, uh, that are present. And no doubt if we study history, we find that in the last 1400 years, there is a, uh, if, if there was a concerted effort to reduce the number of Muslims as far as birth rate is concerned, we will not be where we are today in terms of the number. Um, certainly because of the persecution of the Muslims and the oppression that they had encountered uh, different uh, sects and denominations within the Muslim Ummah, it's like the followers of Ahl al-Bayt, have endured much more suffering, much more persecution. However, we see that on, uh, on the wars, on the famines and diseases and so on, we would have perhaps today have much less than we uh, are witnessing and seeing. But the emphasis throughout the time has passed on through generations. And this was the sunnah, uh, the, the method of the prophets as well. We have, for example, Prophet uh, Ya'qub alayhi salam, who is revered and respected not only amongst Muslims, but also non-Muslims uh, as far as Christians and Jews are concerned. You are uh, told, we are told that he, for example, had uh, 11, uh, for example, sons. In addition yeah. to Yusuf, we have Imam al Qadim alayhi salam who had uh, more than 20, we are 23. Uh, we have Imam al Hassan alayhi salam al Mujtaba. Examples of the Prophets and the Ahl al Bayt alayhi salam they give a uh, role model for people to understand the importance of birth rate. But we have to say, uh, increasing birth rate here, that I remember in the United Kingdom, I spoke to a brother who is a Somali brother. And uh, he said to me, he has uh, nine children. Uh, he wasn't that old. He was in his 40s or 50s. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, I have nine children. So I said, how, was the, how old is the um, uh, oldest one? And he said, 19, 20. But he was uh, also distraught. I said, what's the problem? And he said, well, you know, this 19-year-old, 18-year-old is not praying and he's not uh, performing his Islamic duties. At the same time as we see the growth in number, there is an emphasis in Islamic teachings as well on the quality of the individuals and the Muslims being raised by the family. So we, we must not give the wrong impression that it is all about the quantity and let us increase uh, the number of Muslims for the sake of it. Because we have today Muslims, unfortunately, who are abusing the name of Islam and are actually killing others in the name of Islam and have hijacked the beautiful teachings of the Prophet, the Ahl al-Bayt alayhum salam, and have perpetrated crimes against humanity. So it is not the simple case that they are Muslims, but rather this they Islam, uh -huh, exactly, this Islam, Islam has to be the, uh, the pure Islam of the Holy Prophet, the Islam that the Prophet himself wanted us to practice, uh, according to us in the path of the Ahl al-Bayt, but Islam of morals and values, uh, the Islam of principles, not just, uh, you know, the fact that people just want to have as many children as they want to and just leave the children without the correct tarbiya, the correct upbringing, the correct focus and attention to their duties and their responsibilities. Thank you so much for that, Sheikh. Um, this brings up another point. Does the negative propaganda against Islam and Muslims, which reached its highest levels after 9-11, and the shameful behavior of some terrorist groups making that make people less eager to convert or revert to Islam, 
I mean, does the presence of terrorists have an impact on the predicted growth of Muslim population in the world? If so, what is that impact? I think many of us would probably think that's the case. So if we were to look at the terrible depiction of Muslims that is found today, I would argue that perhaps today we are in a much worse position in terms of the image of Islam than after 9-11. 9-11, the tragedy, the, the atrocities that happened in America, afterwards it has been an increase in the Islamophobia and the negative depiction of Islam and Muslims. Today, with the presence and the criminal actions of groups such as ISIS, Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and others in Pakistan like Sapahi Sahaba, Lashkar Jahangari, and it's these terrible. terrorist organizations. It has definitely made the image much more negative and gloomier than in 9-11. 9-11, mm -hmm. perhaps people began to uh, somehow start asking questions. Who is this Bin Laden? Where does he come from? Why is he killing non-Muslims? What is happening? All these questions began to be asked. Interestingly, however, statistics today show us that after 9-11, much more Quran copies in America were sold. And people wanted to read, what is this Islam? Before we have heard about it. People wanted to ask and wonder about this new new religion sort of thing. Yes, yes, yes. People wanted to establish, is it the religion of hate and terror as these people are espousing and presenting in their actions? Or is it not as they see the vast majority of Muslims are peaceful, coexistent, law-abiding citizens, especially in the West? And so prog progressively, as we have seen more and more criminal terrorist actions taking place around the world, there is this impression that yes, Islam is on the decline as far as numbers or at least Muslim numbers are on the decline. However, I think what we have noticed, if we take an example from the life of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his family and the Ahl al-Bayt, specifically Amir al-Mu'mineen, Imam Ali alayhi salam, you find that even when there is increasing negative publicity and propaganda, you see, the Prophet of Islam for 13 years was in Mecca between the age of 40 to 53. And he was subjected to the cruelest of punishments and treatments, being called a sorcerer, being called a magician, uh, being called a somebody who is uh, not real, trying to deceive people. Yet you see today the impact and the power that he had. And of course, later, only 10 years later, there's the, the, or less actually, eight years after he migrated to Medina, the Me city of Mecca was freed and liberated without a single drop of blood being shed. Amir al-Mu'mineen, peace be upon him. How many enemies did he have? Because he was on the path of righteousness and wanted to preach justice mm -hmm. and the truth. For example, he would be uh, approached by people like certain companions like Talha and Zubair who would be asked give us more because we are the companions of the Prophet. Amir al muminin like some politicians today, may have just to keep them quiet, give them more. But he was a man of God who is principled, who had principles. Now his principle was that there must be, there must be justice. And therefore he said to them, I will give you the same as I will give everyone else. Therefore they would fight him in the battle of Jamal and then Muawiyah in the Battle of Safin, and then Khawarij in the Battle of Nahrawan. After all this, then over a hundred years, Bani Umayyah wanted to tarnish and destroy his reputation by cursing his b blessed name from the pulpits and uh, trying to fabricate a hadith about Imam alayhi salam. Uh, Samar ibn Jundub, he is one of the nar uh, narrators of hadith, which unfortunately some of our Muslim uh, brothers around the world still accept him, but he is a fasiq, he is uh, somebody who has gone out of the faith in many ways. Uh, he had been approached by Muawiyah 
and he was fabricating the hadith that um, uh, the, the verse in the Holy Quran, La taqrabu salata wa antum sukara, do not approach prayers and you are in a state of intoxicants. It was revealed because Ali ibn Abi Talib, God forbid, was in the state of intoxication. Such, my point is, after all this, you look at where Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu alayhi is today. He is a beacon, he is a great leader for people to follow his shrine and the shrine of his beloved son, Imam al Hussein, here in Karbala, and the millions who come. The same for Abu Abdullah, the grandson of the Holy Prophet, Imam Hussein, peace and blessings be upon him. Bani Umayyah and Bani al Abbas tried to distort, tried to fabricate, tried to, uh, you know, uh, spread rumors. They would say uh, he uh, came. Uh, with the uh, fact that he is uh, the grandson of the Prophet, but he was killed with the sword of his uh, gra uh, grandfather. Uh, but all this did not make any difference. And even today, when we see, yes, there are some people in the West who are gradually trying to um, understand or have got a mis uh, conception or misconstrued idea about Islam. Mm -hmm. But this has led to more and more people asking about Islam, investigating about Islam. We find the number of reverts, if we investigate and look at the research, the number of reverts has increased in places like the United Kingdom, United States, especially with the females who have discovered the path of Islam to be the path the which give, liberates them from the chains and the shackles and so forth. Therefore, we could argue that yes, it may outwardly give a negative image and it is not something we are happy with. We're not saying that it should continue, but rather what we're saying is we as believers in the path of the Holy Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt, we say that this negative image that the, these criminals these terrorists are giving it is not something that uh, gives us any happiness but rather sadness but at the same time we must utilize it to invite people towards the path to present them with the true correct teachings as they are now more open people at work people at college people at university are coming and asking this Islam is this Islam of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi or ISIS or what is this Islam that you're talking about so we now have a chance Back in the time, they will not speak about this. They will just don't know. They don't want to know. And even if you go to them, they're not interested. But now it's in the news. Now everybody's talking they're about it. About so it. the wondering is a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that yes, these are difficult times. They are very testing times for Muslims and, and uh, the followers of the Holy Prophet. However, it is a chance for tabligh, it's a chance for the positive image to be presented to those people who are inquisitive, who are trying to find more and more uh, information about the teachings of the religion. Yes, In your opinion, what measures should the Muslims take to change this adversity? I think it is a tremendous responsibility that falls on the shoulders of the Muslims in this day and age. And I say to my brothers and sisters anywhere and everywhere around the world that today is not like yesterday and yesterday is not like the day before every day the dynamic is changing every day the situation is different perhaps to the worse as far as propaganda is, is concerned so we have unfortunately the 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 crimes and the atrocities happening in the uh, different parts of the world starting of course in iraq and in syria and in Saudi, and in Bahrain, and in Pakistan, and other places. Then, unfortunately, we see it also now spreading to parts of Europe. In Paris, the, the atrocities in Paris, recently in Belgium, Belgium. and in America, the, the shootings and what is California. happening there, yeah, in California. So, more and more, Muslims are being asked the question, where do you stand as far as the ideology of terrorism and the ideology of violence and hatred is concerned. Mm -hmm. And it is so important today for Muslims. Unfortunately, when ISIS first came, Daesh, there was a reluctance by the non-Shia Muslims to condemn. Mm -hmm. I remember in the United Kingdom, and I'm traveling in the United States, I speak with the scholars of our brothers, the Ahl Sunnah, and I say to them, where, why are you not speaking out? They say, this is between Sunni and Shia, I don't want to. But then they saw the barbaric animal 
nature of these individuals. In fact, they are worse than animals. They are worse. So they are now, in the last maybe year or so, having to come out and condemn them because they say uh, they know that these people, Daesh, are speaking or they're saying we are Sunni. The so they must, they, rep yeah, they must distance themselves away from this ideology. But the responsibility of the Muslims is number one, to look at themselves, to look at their behavior, to look at their conduct, to look at their way they interact with people of other faiths. In all levels, at school, university, at work, neighbors, our uh, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, peace be upon him, he says he, he, he has trained his Shia, his followers, Kunu lana zaynan wa la tukunu alayna shayna. Be good role models for us. Examples where people will look and say, this is how a Muslim should be. Hatta yaqulu nas rahimallahu Ja'far ibn Muhammad kayfa adda bashi'ata. So that people will say, peace be upon Ja'far, the son of Muhammad al-Baqir, who has been able to train his Shia, his followers. Now today, the responsibility upon our the Muslim Ummah is to recognize the dangerous ideology and the cancerous lesion that exists within the Muslim Ummah, and that's takfirism. It is not good enough to come and say, I am against Daesh, I am against ISIS, mm -hmm. I am against this takfiri ideology. It is also to look at the books that they are teaching in Madrasa, to look at the speakers they are bringing in Jum'ah Khutbah and in the, in the West, to look at what hatred on the YouTube and other things they are presenting against other schools of thought, which leads towards violence, which leads towards killing of the, of the for example, the Shia and the others as well. And to purify that kind of, uh, to distance themselves from that kind of terminology, that kind of uh, speech, that kind of methodology. The other responsibility exists is today, more and more people are hungry to find out about Islam. Mm -hmm. So we must have more productions such as media publications productions, and publications. We need media like correct movies. There was a movie called Innocence of Muslims, which caused outrage a few years ago because it was uh, blasphemous against the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 14 minutes it was put on YouTube, but uh, or shorter, but it caused people to become very angry and they went uh, everywhere in the world and they were uh, demonstrating and people were killed and so on. But why we are just reactionary? Why do we not advance and think beforehand? Why do we not go and say, you know what, let's produce a very good movie about the Prophet of Islam? Not Number one. Too. Number two, why don't we have good publications, good websites? Alhamdulillah, there's some good websites, but there needs to be more concerted more. effort. Yes. yes. Our presence in social media, in Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, these uh, air mediums should be a good presence. And we should not allow the extremist to enter and to uh, take part. We should sideline the extremists and say, not in our name. They do not speak on our behalf. Mm -hmm. The Muslims today have a huge, huge responsibility to uh, correct what is being happening today. And this is a test from the Almighty Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. We should not think, oh, but why? I don't like this. This is why it is happening. No, we should seize the opportunity. This is a chance for tabliq, for the da'wah, exactly. To really work hard to present the correct image of the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his mm -hmm. progeny, and to send a very strong message of um, rejection of the extremists and that we are not violent individuals but rather peaceful loving individuals. Thank you so much. The last question which is uh, interesting, do you think if the Muslims population formed more than half of the world's population, will it change the world? I think today if we look at what is the dynamics in the world, we see that the reality with reflection mm -hmm shows that the power is not with the necessarily the majority or the numbers, but rather some minority which have developed systems and have utilized different means to be more influential. The Jewish population in the world 
is okay. not even close to the Muslim population. Yet they have an impact. But they have a tremendous impact. You look at the media. You look at, uh, for example, Hollywood, the movie productions and, and so on. You look at international politics, some prominent politicians. You look at the uh, United States, the lobby that exists there. You look at all that is happening around the world and you come to the conclusion that it is not about, for example, oh, half of the population. It's about whether we are ready to step up and take an active role. Our social responsibilities, our political responsibilities, our role in the West, for example, and in other parts of the world to really be influential, to be people who will be heard, not just to keep demanding, but when the Muslims are powerful, then the people will listen. When the Muslims have many organizations, many agencies, many lobbies, mm -hmm. strong, the world is all about lobbies today. Who can influence governments? Who can influence media? Who has penetrated through systems? Mm -hmm. That is what we need. We need intellectuals, education at university levels. We need people who are experienced and expertise in all levels, in economy, in the fields, for example, of health, in media, in all these areas, in different parts of the world, we need experts. Sadly, we're not seeing the advancement of education in the Muslim world. They are not worried as much about the high standards of education to uh, promote high standards of education, but rather they are worried more about you know violence and killing this person and and uh, you know look at for example what's happening in Emirates and Dubai and the building of uh, very tall uh, structures. That is okay. what they you know it's all skyscrapers. It's all superficial. Whereas it's no focus on the real development of the Muslim mind and the Muslim mentality. That's not what we're seeing. And unfortunately, until we see that, regardless of the numbers that we have, we will not be as influential as some others. Thank you so much, Sheikh. Thank, Thank you for you your very time. Much. Thank you. Dear viewers, this concludes our first episode of the Islamic Expansion series. Uh, stay tuned for the upcoming episode, which we will discuss um, the expansion of Shia Islam. We thank you, dear viewers, once again for watching, and we thank our dear guest, Sheikh Muhammad Hali, for joining us thank today. You. Until next time, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.